Hi everyone. Well, you know I've done a number of videos about the Millennium Tower in San Francisco. So a lot of you in my previous video stated that you thought this building should be just taken down proactively. And some of you posed the question, well, how would you actually do that? And that's a huge challenge. But we have some guidance now from what's been going on in New York and major cities in Australia. Uh, there's been buildings taken down in a controlled fashion. In Melbourne and Sydney, uh, multiple buildings in New York, including uh, the Deutsche Bank building from a few years ago. But uh, this one takes the cake. I'm going to show you what they did to take down a 707 foot tall building, which is almost 60 feet taller than the Millennium Tower in San Francisco. And they did that to make way for J.P. Morgan Chase's new headquarters building in New York City. The plan, and it's ongoing, they've nearly topped out with the construction of this new building, but it'll be over 1,300 feet tall once it's completed. And to date, it's the largest controlled deconstruction. Hesitate to use the word demolition because usually that suggests something explosive or a in terms of bringing a building down quickly or a wrecking ball, this is deconstruction. And so I want to go through a couple of videos here to show you what this process looks like. And I think they'd be looking at a similar situation in San Francisco if it was determined that this building had to be taken down. So let's just look at a few pictures here. This is a Union Carbide building constructed from 1957 to 1960, and it was deconstructed between 2019 and 2021. There were some people who protested that it was being taken down, but... Uh, I think J.P. Morgan's inclined to get their way on these matters. This is what the base of the new building looks like. A really interesting uh, lobby area or, or near ground level area with that tapered support. Now, I suppose uh, the overall construction, although they don't break out the separate deconstruction and new construction costs, but the total project cost is $3 billion. I suppose as a company, you could afford to do that, when you get a $25 billion bailout from the federal government in 2008. Now, one of the things they did to mitigate the impact of basically taking down a perfectly serviceable building was that they stated they recycled 90% of the material taken from this building, which is pretty phenomenal. Usually the big cost of these deconstruction involves sending materials to landfill, which is quite costly. And again, I mentioned uh, this $3 billion total project cost. They really didn't give a breakdown. I'd be curious what the portion was to deconstruct the building, the unit carbide building. My guess is it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars range. I mean, let's go through what you actually have to do. Let's look at this example here for this uh, building in Melbourne. You have to install scaffolding around the building. That keeps debris from falling down on the sidewalk and hitting other buildings and roadways. Then they enclose it in a mesh, probably some sheeting as well to maintain the dust into the interior of the building. And they basically clad the entire building in a temporary enclosure. And then they just tape the building down floor by floor. Of course, prior to this, they'll remove the entire facade of the building, metal framework, glass, the windows, everything that's hanging on the exterior building as part of the facade. They'll also strip the interior of the building and just leaving the structural supports, the floors that can be taken down a floor at a time. It's really impressive and it's uh, very tedious and, and no doubt very expensive. Here's an example of what they did in Sydney, that AMP tower, I don't know if they call it the AMP tower, but AMP tower, they didn't actually tear the entire building down. They stripped a lot of it off to use as a framework for building a larger building over the top of it. So what would lead to someone taking down the Millennium Tower in a controlled demolition? You know, again, I think the original Millennium Tower construction cost was around $300 million. That was from the early 2000s to its completion in 2009. You can imagine that trying to deconstruct a building in the heart of San Francisco on Mission Street here would cost probably two to three hundred million dollars, based on my estimate from uh, looking at other projects. That the Deutsche Building in New York cost over one hundred sixty million dollars to deconstruct. So again, you're talking about a lot of money, and unfortunately for the Millennium Tower, they're facing headwinds uh, for multiple locations. So, you know, they 
recently hit the owners of these units for $6.8 million through a, a assessment of the condo association on these unit owners to recoup the cost overrun for this so-called repair, which was supposed to be $100 million and turned out to be $150 million. So again, I don't know if they've got money budgeted for these periodic adjustments or rejacking of the load applied to the separate or piling. But also these owners haven't been able to sell these units for months. There's been uh, 15 to 20 units for sale of May of 2023. That's about how many are still for sale. I don't see anybody lining up to buy these units. And of course, this is within the context of the broader flight, as it were, from the people in downtown San Francisco. They're, they're leaving to work uh, remotely. A lot of the office towers are empty. The building across the street, the Salesforce Tower from Millennium Tower, the building directly across the street from Millennium Tower is the Salesforce Tower. And I understand it's almost uh, entirely empty with everybody working from home. And, you know, Salesforce owns Tableau. Uh, my company does work with Tableau using their products, and everyone I deal with works from home. So San Francisco is really emptying out right now. So it's, it would be an extreme circumstance for someone to come along and say, hey, let's deconstruct this building and spend two or $300 million. Although that may be very well what needs to happen. It's ongoing host of problems, the so-called foundation repair with the 18 perimeter piling, I also recently did an update video showing that they're getting ready to hit a reportable threshold of lower loads on the pile after they applied jacking loads last July. And uh, it looks like they're going to have to reapply loads based on current trends sometime next summer. Uh, it looks like extend the current trend line and uh, their actionable level for increasing the loads for essentially averaging around 900 kits per pile which is around 16,200 kits in total, will occur around June 1st. So it's not clear to me right now whether they've got a budget to continue spending money addressing this uh, remediation or revisiting it repeatedly. I mean, if they reapply the loads next summer, that'll only be a year after they applied them to begin with. So a lot of you pose the question, particularly in the light of potential hazards to the building from earthquake loading, uh, noting the dissimilar foundation types, you have 900, almost 1,000 interior pilings, part of the original construction that only go down about 80 feet. And you've got these perimeter piling that go down to bedrock just on one corner of the building, the northwest corner, in depths of over 200 feet. So th there's a lot of question about how this building is going to perform during an earthquake. And even the designers of this, again, so-called repair acknowledge that in their opinion the building will survive a major earthquake it won't collapse catastrophically however do acknowledge that the damage to the building could be so extensive that no one could live there right now the designers the city of san francisco seem committed to their assertion that this building will perform adequately during an earthquake there's been a lot of professional engineers with tremendous amounts of experience who seriously question that outcome that they think this building is at significant risk uh, major damage or even collapse during a major earthquake. So unless something new comes to light to really force the city to take a harder look at this, I think where this building is headed, and this is outside the scope of my engineering topics, as it were, that I like to cover on this channel, but essentially an economic loss. If people aren't able to sell these units, if people who own these units keep getting ongoing repair bills in the tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's going to get to the point where people are just going to leave, just going to abandon it. Not unlike what you see in cities like Detroit, where people just, just left, left their houses behind, some cases left their possessions and just, and just moved. So I'm not saying San Francisco is on the path of Detroit, uh, but it, there's a different situation in San Francisco as in New York. In New York, you can spend hundreds of millions of dollars deconstructing a building, because something much bigger and much more expensive is going to go in its place. I really don't see that scenario in San Francisco based on the research I've conducted anytime soon. So perhaps the advent of AI companies 
will help reinvigorate San Francisco. I, I don't know if those will be local jobs or again, remote jobs. I mean, there's, there's hope that uh, development will resume again, but from what I understand a lot of building contractors, residential housing contractors have just left. They're going to places like Texas and Florida where they're building hundreds, if not thousands of homes each year it's part of the new new uh, unit inventory that people can buy. That's not happening in San Francisco. So another candidate for building deconstructions in New York, and uh, this this one six one Maid Lane building, which I've talked about in the past. It's a very narrow aspect building, very tall building that's got an excessive amount of tilt. And they get us because they elected to not go with full depth pile foundations to bedrock, and apparently decided to go with soil cement stabilization. So more or less a shallow foundation on stabilized soil. That's part of the landfill, actually, going back to the 1800s. And uh, they're still slogging it out in court, but current trends indicate that this isn't headed to a, a very good outcome. I mean, nobody's living in the building. It's, uh, you know, once you have a building with foundation problems, there's a lot, a lot you can do. I mean, there are a few things you can do, but they're expensive. You take Millennium Tower, the interior support plan for repair was going to cost around $100 million. I think that was the best option to go with. I don't see any way that they would revisit it at this point now that they've gone with this perimeter pilot. So essentially, you're going to have the situation where perhaps more and more public attention will be brought to bear to further assess the seismic stability of this building. It may be that it's ongoing re repair. Very costly re repair has to occur for this building. The unit you know, owners are just gonna just gonna leave, just gonna tap out. So I, I don't know. I'd like to hear your comments about that. But in terms of the technical aspects of being able to deconstruct the building, it can be done. It's very expensive and it's very time consuming. Again, the Union Carbide building in New York took about two years to take down in a controlled fashion. So I think in San Francisco. If the Millennium Tower were to be deconstructed, you'd be looking at a two or three year time frame. And it would be in the order, I think, and it would be on the order, I think, two or $300 million to do. So I hope you enjoyed this video. A uh, shout out to my channel members. I appreciate your support. Thanks to everyone who has liked, subscribed, and commented. And please stay tuned for future videos.